Welcome to episode 26 of the AMT podcast. Hope you all had a good week as usual. What a crazy week it's been. A lot of mistakes made, but that was largely offset by many more good decisions. And it culminated in my best week of the year so far. So we kicked off with a bang. Two lovely test match results to start off the week. Now I traded these games last week and I think I explained that in the last episode. But they didn't settle till Monday, so they count as this week's profits. Now, I really didn't expect a draw in the India match, so that came as a real surprise. Nor did I expect such a competitive match in the New Zealand-Sri Lanka game, which looked like it was going to be washed out. It was just hosing down with rain. Now, bear in mind, I've got to wake up through the early hours, I think through 10 p.m. till 6 a.m. in order to trade these matches. So the draw was nailed on, and I thought, I'll go for a two-hour nap and leave my notifications on, on ESPN, which I ended up sleeping through. But by the time I woke up, I saw that play had resumed after a four-hour delay. The draw traded as short as 1.03, and New Zealand were chasing 285. The draw was around 1.2 um, at the time, and providing the run rate doesn't lag too far behind uh, when it gets to the final 15 overs, I figured this could be a good trade to make by laying the draw. So I did just that, and I ended up adding £900 profit to my position at the end of play. So both these markets settled on a Monday, as I said, and I was already over £2,000 profit before Cheltenham had even started. And this is where I made a fatal error. See, Cheltenham is ordinarily one of, if not the biggest week of the year for me. However, with that two grand head start, I started to get ahead of myself and I started adjusting my projections for the festival. Anyone that's traded festivals know that the first day is always the hardest. So it's the day you have to bet the most defensively. But because I already had a goal in mind and because I started the week so well, I was looking to, you know, make more than what I anticipated. So I was looking to make around three grand off Cheltenham and I was looking to bring my week total to around 5,000 in profits. What ended up happening was I started pushing too hard. I started overstaking. I started getting greedy with positions and overtraded and... When it comes to trading in play at Cheltenham, down the final straight, which is slightly uphill, um, that's exactly where you want to get out your positions, especially on these grade one listed horses where they are such good quality. A horse can, in theory, make so many mistakes and still come from behind and close the gap and win. And that's exactly what happened. I stayed in my lay. Uh, I didn't close out my lay positions. And some of these horses went on to come back and win. And I just got absolutely battered on day one i ended up having my worst day ever at the festival at the very start over one thousand pounds profit down so all my targets were just out the window at this point and i was really pissed off now I've spoken in the past about journaling your bad losses or bad decisions or bad days so i went out of my way to do just that and it really helps venting and having it on paper and as you can see here i really went into the nitty gritty and really detailed what I was thinking about and what prompted me to make such bad decisions. And it came down to my old bad habit of greed. So what I did was I scrapped my targets altogether. I just forgot about it. I said to myself, just enjoy the tournament and just treat every race as a bonus and just make what you can and just trade what's in front of you. So I did just that. And lo and behold, day two was my best ever day at the festival. So back to back, I had my worst day and followed it up with my best day. My mind was fresh and clear. I put absolutely no pressure on myself and I traded like a dream. Day three and four were tidy. I had to cut day four early because I had to take my mother out for an early Mother's Day present. Saturday was supposed to be a day off, but once again, I made a bad decision and ended up needlessly giving back some money on the racing. Um... I didn't even plan on trading on Saturday and I had no interest in working. Concentration wasn't there, so I just pulled the plug early. And again, I journaled why I even decided to trade knowing that I wasn't switched on and this time it was down to boredom. Boredom, greed, arrogance, laziness. It's always the same usual suspects when it comes to bad days. And all these emotions are derivatives of the one same emotion, which is fear. Fear of losing, fear of missing out, fear of not making enough, fear of not hitting targets. It's so important to understand what triggers your emotions that prompt you to trade badly. That way you can nip it in the bud. You can identify 
uh, where the problems stem from and you can break you can break that chain that habit chain early on so had I not journaled on my first day at Cheltenham I'd have continued to have those profit targets there would be an unbelievable amount of pressure on me going into day two day three and day four because I would have had to have pulled in results which I've never done before and in order to do that I would have had to have traded or gambled even outside of my plan and that only ends one way. The only way I was able to rally back and trade so well on day two, day three, day four is because I took all the pressure off myself. When it came to Saturday, like I said, I was trading out of boredom. I find that, you know, I have to be absorbed in some sort of activity in my downtime in order to remove the temptation to trade because, you know, this can very easily become an addiction and I find myself having to tear myself away from the screen um, a lot of the time which is not good. The devil makes work for idle thumbs. Anyway, Saturday night, I went out for dinner, cigars, and just some downtime with friends, and we went to watch the UFC. And wow, what a victory that was for Leon Edwards, our very own. Kamar Usman is just a beast of a fighter. I mean, he's just a true physical specimen. Um, he's just so much stronger than everyone else at the weight. It's almost unfair. The thing is with wrestlers and grapplers in the UFC is that they have a very distinct advantage over strikers. It doesn't matter how good you are at striking. Someone who's proficient at taking you down, all they got to do is pin you down or keep their weight on you for the entirety of the round. And, you know, they can win the fight that way. So strikers who have weak grappling really have their work cut out. And it really shows if you go off the UFC's roster of champions, nearly all of them are proficient at grappling or some sort of wrestling or submission ground game. Having said all that, after that spectacular knockout of Usman last time round, despite winning the fight, and when you couple that with Leon's hometown advantage coming into this rematch, I thought that this fight will at least get close. So when I saw how brilliantly Leon was stuffing and just parrying uh, Usman's takedown attempts and when I saw how crisp his striking was and he was landing that left leg at will to the body, I thought, you know, this is, this is a great trade to get involved in. So I already had half a stake on Leon pre-match at around 3.5, I think he was, and then added another half stake at around evens and just rode it out. So made a nice chunk of change, which paid for dinner and cigars. When it comes to UK and mixed martial arts, the UK has long produced elite boxers since we have some of the best infrastructure in the world when it comes to grooming talent. We have some of the best coaches in the world. We have, I don't know, over a thousand boxing gym, maybe thousands of boxing gyms. We have the ABA tournaments, the England squads, the Olympic squads. There's a solid pathway to go from the bottom to the top. But MMA is a far smaller niche in the UK. It's very rare that you're going to hear someone who goes to a jiu-jitsu gym or an MMA gym. They're quite hard to find. So it's even more special when we see a, fight, a fighter from the UK come through, let alone get to the very top like Leon did. Michael Bisping was obviously the first fighter to pave the way and become a UFC, UFC champion. And around 15 or so years ago, MMA was practically unheard of in the UK. There was literally zero gyms where there were practitioners of grappling and mixed martial arts. Now that Leon's done it, the floodgates are well and truly open. And there's already some highly touted talents up and down the UFC roster. The heavyweight Tom Aspinall and lightweight Paddy Pimblett, just to name a couple of the rising stars from these aisles. This is probably one of the most exciting times to be a mixed martial arts fan from the UK. With the steady rising roster of UK talent and the regular routine blockbuster matchups that we're seeing what feels like every month now. It was only a couple of years ago where... You know, literally no one had heard of Leon Edwards, so no one was really inclined to give him a title shot. Now he's the number one guy. He's the it man. He's got a target on his back, and everyone wants a piece of the action. Colby flew in as a backup. Now, Colby Covington, he's had two bites of the cherry already, and he's lost, albeit to Komaru Usman, who is probably one of the best of this generation. But Colby's wrestling is arguably as good as Komaru. The only difference is the physicality. I mean, he's... Let's face it, he's a powder puff puncher and he can't really hurt anyone in the division. However, he's got stamina for days and he can wrestle. So I think Leon will have enough to deal with him, but it's probably going to be an almost as hard fight as Kamaru Usman. Then you got Jorge Masvidal, who ironically 
didn't want to give Leon a chance a couple of years ago, and then he went on to assault him, as many of you know who watched the UFC. And it's kind of funny to see how things have come full circle because Jorge's lost three or four of his last of his last fights. He's had his shot at the UFC title. Um, he's been beaten thoroughly and convincingly by Usman and Co- uh, Covington. And now he's got his work cut out against Gilbert Burns. And this could be the nail in the coffin for him if he loses. Now, the fight hasn't been priced up yet, but I'm thinking Gilbert Burns is going to be around 1.2, 1.25 going into that fight. Um, so there's not much value in it, but it's probably a fair price given the stage that Jorge is at in his career. I think it's kind of funny how the UFC have made such a blunder by banking on Jorge becoming one of the biggest stars in the sport by offering him one of the most lucrative contracts to a welterweight in UFC history. And as soon as he signed that contract, he's lost pretty much every fight. So he could probably go down as one of the richest gatekeepers or road warriors in the fight, which is perhaps not the worst title to have. But when it comes to having a shot at the champ, Leon Edwards, a guy that he not only insulted, but assaulted, um, it looks like he's a long way off that. And Leon's really going to milk it by by not giving him that chance. And rightly so. Whatever happens, whoever Leon fights, whether it's Jorge or Gilbert Burns or Colby Covington, these are all close matchups. And that's just testament to how exciting the UFC is because rarely do you ever see a world title fight where it's a foregone conclusion, unlike boxing. Every fight is cutthroat. The competition is so stiff and these guys face each other all the time. There's no hiding Unlike boxing, you didn't think I'd get through this episode without mentioning the least surprising news of the week uh, coming from the Usyk and Tyson Fury camp in that the negotiations have fallen through again. Welcome to boxing, boys. I don't want to go into details as to whose fault it is because it's just exhausting. And at the end of the day, no one cares. Fight fans don't care. We just want to see the best fight the best. As far as I'm aware, Tyson Fury offered him a 70-30 split to which... Usyk's camp agreed, but Tyson Fury hasn't signed his own contract for his own deadline. So I don't know whether it's Frank Warren's fault or if it's Fury's fault, but it seems like Fury and his camp have really disrespected Usyk and they've treated him as a challenger, as if he were Derek Chisora or whoever, when Usyk, in fact, is the unified heavyweight champion of the world. He's got three titles to Fury's one. And whether you like it or not, this is a must fight for Fury's legacy, he has to beat Usyk in order to be considered an all-time great. That way there can be no question as to who is the best of this era. But once again, we're at stalemate when it comes to negotiations, which is so often the case with boxing. Um, You know, we're not privy to all the contract negotiations that happen. So it's important not to read too much into whose fault it is, whether that's Usyk's, whether that's Frank Warren's, whether that's Usyk's manager, or whether it's Fury. But at the end of the day, it's not a good look for Fury when he's always shouting and venting on Twitter, trying to bully his opponents uh, and their respective teams into signing a contract when he hasn't even signed it himself. So make of that what you will. Frank Warren supposedly has some big news to disclose today, but I'm not going to hold my breath. I wouldn't be surprised if it's Derek Chisora versus Tyson Fury part four, if I'm honest. Anyway, we'll wrap this up here. Um, But yeah, this has been my best week. Uh, so far of the year it's been a very steady start to the year where there's been no dramatic losses or dramatic wins other than this week but uh, I think that's a good omen going forward next month we've got the Grand National we've got the Masters in the Gulf Um, so April is where things really start to heat up and then May June is when we really start to let it rip so I'm feeling very optimistic going forward into the year Um, the winter schedule on test cricket is finally finished so No more cricket in New Zealand, Australia. So I can finally get back to a normal sleep schedule. So it's pretty much just going to be horse racing and evening golf on Sundays going forward. um, Unless I say otherwise, but you'll know. I'll keep you guys posted as I do every week via this podcast. Don't forget to like, comment, share, subscribe, uh, all that good stuff. And I'll see you guys in the next episode next week. Thanks. Peace.